Hello, adventure and fantasy fans, and welcome to episode two of Elijah Menchaca's They Met in a Tavern. I'm Gabe Shear, and this is ChemCat Unwrapped. If you love this story, keep your ears open later in this episode for information on how to win a copy of the full audiobook for free. Previously on They Met in a Tavern, someone is hiring people to attack freelancers in the city of Olwyn, and the Starbreakers might be at the center of it. While investigating the murder of other freelancers, Phoenix finds himself a target as well. Then, his old companion, Brass, is attacked in his own hotel room. Phoenix is through being a bystander, but as he investigates the depths of this new threat, he finds himself meeting with several familiar faces from his past, and most of them don't have good news. Ten. Home. When Armin didn't come home that night, Elizabeth started to regret encouraging him to take the job. First the search for brass, and now this. She missed having someone around to split parenting duties with. And sleep. She also missed sleep. Robin slept through enough of the night now that Elizabeth was at least maintaining a grip on her sanity. But some mornings it didn't feel like it. When she was greeted by the first rays of morning sun and hungry cries from the nursery, she felt like no time at all had passed since she'd closed her eyes. The day stretched out in front of her like a long march, and she missed her bed before she'd even gotten out of it. But Mercy came just a few hours later, when, in the middle of Robin's morning playtime, Elizabeth picked up on someone at the door. His gait was off of its usual rhythm, but she still recognized Armin before she even caught sight of him. The front door unlocking only confirmed it was him. Oh, now you're back, Elizabeth called out as she went to meet him. What took you so? She stopped when she came around the corner and saw the state Armin was in. His armor and clothes were scuffed, dirty, and stained with blood. He had bandages around his forehead and leg. One of his arms hung stiff and awkward. His lip was scabbed from where he'd bitten it and drawn blood, and his nose and eye were bruised. Tucked under one arm was the inactive head of an autostruct. Elizabeth stared, jaw slack. For a moment, she wasn't sure where to start. The head? It's a long story. Elizabeth helped Armin wince his way out of his coat and sat him down in the living room. When Robin saw him, she immediately stopped playing with her toys. She didn't cry, but she did stare, point, and make garbled noises. He started to explain what had happened, but Elizabeth cut him off almost immediately. What's wrong with your arm? Uh, shoulder. Mm. I think it's dislocated. Elizabeth closed the distance between them, and Armin immediately grew wary. He turned trying to keep his shoulder away from her. Elizabeth rolled her eyes. I just want to take a look. Armin hesitantly lowered his guard, allowing her to examine his shoulder. He winced when she felt it, but her touch was disarmingly gentle, and before long, he relaxed in her hands. As soon as he did, she grabbed his wrist, braced her leg on his, and pulled. Armin yelled, startling Robin. Now she was crying but his shoulder was back where it was supposed to be. Oh, what was that for? You're welcome. You're welcome? Can you move your arm now? Armin stopped yelling and tested his arm. It still hurt. Didn't have the full range of motion that it should, but it felt infinitely better. Mm, yes. Good, Elizabeth said. Her attention turned to their crying child. Give me a minute, then you can explain. It took only a few minutes to take care of Robin, and when Elizabeth came back, 
She had a bandage roll in her hand and stalks of lavender tucked under her arm. She silenced his protests with a look before he could form them and started stripping the purple flowers off of the ends of the stalks, collecting them in her hand. She reached out with herself, letting the flow of her own being touch the life still in the petals and bulbs and willed that life into her palm. In response, the flowers dissolved into her skin, leaving a faint purple color and a tingling warmth. She ran her hand across the wound in Armin's leg, slowly and carefully. Where she touched, the same sensation in her skin spread across Armin's, and the wound rapidly began to shrink and close. She repeated the process, one injury at a time, mending every scrape and bruise she could see. But her magic didn't completely heal. She wiped clean and bandaged. This wasn't the first time she'd done this for him, but it had been a long time since he'd been this bad. Start talking. He told her what had happened the night before, starting with arriving at the scene of the fire and ending with Caitlin bailing him out of jail on behalf of a very angry Harbin. She did her best to stay calm during the story, even as tough as it was to hear that people had tried to kill him. She kept her face neutral, but her fingers twitched the way they always did when she was anxious. When he was done recounting the details, Elizabeth had to take a breath. Every fiber of her screamed to get up, go out, and do something. But she restrained herself. Folding her hands to keep her fingers still, she asked, But why you? I don't know. Maybe they were trying to cover up what happened to the shield and knew I was looking into it. Or maybe... For some reason, in that moment, Armin thought of brass, back at the lilac, attacked by a pair of swords for hire. Why? I mean... The golden shield last week, brass two days ago, and me yesterday, makes three different attacks on freelancers in the city. What if it's connected? Elizabeth raised an eyebrow. What if it is? If it is, Armin frowned, thinking. Three attacks on freelancers in a short span of time, with no obvious personal motivation. That almost always meant a sword-for-hire job. If the attacks were connected, if someone was targeting freelancers and money was involved, one attack was not going to be the end of it. People were going to keep coming after them until either someone finished the job or the person doing the hiring decided to pull it. Harbin had good people on the watch, and now with confirmation that their errand squad had been killed, the Academy would be stepping in too. He should have been fine with that. Just yesterday, he was trying to wash his hands of the Castellan's business and go back to his quiet life in his quiet home. But something within him rebelled. A switch had been flipped somewhere in his mind, and gears that had gone years without turning were active and refusing to go dormant again. How could he leave this to someone else? Someone whose priorities were completely different from his. The worst part was how little he knew about what was going on. How personal was this? How focused on him? How dangerous were the people involved? He didn't know anything. He hated not knowing things. I can't just do nothing he said. So what's the plan? Do some digging, ask around, figure out what exactly is causing all this, Armin said. He ran his fingers through his hair. I've got almost nothing to go on right now. If I can get a sense of what we're dealing with, I can figure out what to do about it. Maybe I'm just seeing something that isn't there. Maybe it's small and doesn't actually involve me, and Harbin can handle it. But maybe... He stopped but they both knew what he meant. Maybe they should handle this personally. It would be exactly what Harbin wouldn't want him to do. Exactly what he would have done without a second thought when he was younger. When he was Phoenix. Elizabeth raised an eyebrow. I thought you were done being a freelancer. I am. You're talking like one. She was right, and he knew she was right. The line of thinking he was using only ended one way. Running around, facing down criminals, and pointedly ignoring any authority figure that might want him to stop and let them handle things. 
dangerous, but effective, and on his terms. The memory of his fight from the night before came back, and all the feelings that had come with it. Not just the fear, but the clarity. He'd forgotten how simple and straightforward things had been as a freelancer. Nothing to worry about but the very solvable problem in front of him. Just for this. And only until we figure out if Harbin can handle it, he said. Elizabeth wasn't sure she believed that. Neither was Armin. Where do we start? Armin drummed his fingers. One of the assassins who attacked me is still alive, but Harbin would never let me near him. The guys who came after Brass are dead, and whoever hit the golden shield are in the wind. So, I was thinking, uh, clock tower. They'll kill you on sight, only if I go as me. Elizabeth's eyes lit up as she parsed his implication. If Clock Tower would kill him on sight, there were really only two options. Not be seen at all, or not look like himself at all. Planning on going alone? Not exactly, Armin shrugged. I mean, I'm not sure. Elizabeth felt a twinge of disappointment when he didn't ask her to come. Already her heart rate had increased just thinking about an undercover mission in enemy territory. What do you mean? I was thinking of asking Brass for help. Really? Really. Armin almost couldn't believe he was saying it either. He's still in town. He could find Clock Tower faster than I can. He can talk anything out of anybody. And if things go sideways, he is good in a fight. You think he'll say yes? I don't know. A part of me hopes he doesn't. Well, if he says no... I'll manage on my own. Elizabeth frowned. Armin noticed and realized he'd upset her. But he wasn't sure how, and he didn't know how to fix it. She could see him struggling, mentally playing back his own words, looking for where he'd tripped up, and gave him an out. Where do I fit into this plan? I need you here. Someone has to keep an eye on the house and make sure nobody's tracked down where we live, and keep Robin safe if they have. She hated how good he could be at making sense. Her fingers were twitching even more now, but she nodded. Okay. She was still upset. Arma was sure of it. Even if he wasn't sure exactly why, he wanted to make her feel better. He took her hand, and in doing so, felt the twitch of her fingers against his palm. Even unsure of the source, he knew what the tick meant. He squeezed her hand tight and met her emerald gaze, his way to focus her attention and slow her down. We'll figure something out. In seconds, the twitching of her fingers stopped. A small smile appeared on Elizabeth's face. You're smart and I'm stubborn. She rested her head on his shoulder and breathed. There was still a whirlwind in her stomach, but it was calmer now. For one quiet moment, they stood holding each other. Then she nudged him with her forehead. One more thing. What? What are you planning on doing with that? Elizabeth pointed at Gamma's severed head, which currently sat on their dining table, staring back at them with dark, lifeless eyes. Oh, right. Eleven. Professionals. Brass adjusted the amount of chest his shirt left exposed, attempting to walk the fine line between socially acceptable and obvious troll. It was a delicate balance, and he'd spent the last hour trying to perfect it. Just the right amount of makeup on his eyes and cheeks, a dash of perfume, an eye-catching dark purple suit, cuffed boots with pointed toes and two-inch heels. He turned away from the mirror, presenting himself to his date. What do you think? Her name was Ruby. Well, her working name, anyway. They weren't really on a real name basis. She stared at him, arms folded, a look of amused disbelief on her face. I think this is the weirdest thing a client's ever asked for. Ruby was an escort for the lilac. 
Instead of the normal provocative clothing the lilac dressed their escorts in, she was wearing an outfit brass had provided for her, mostly black, accented by a pure white coat and minimalist silver jewelry. Brass broke out in a smile. Love that honesty. I meant, how do I look? Ruby looked him up and down for a moment. Like an expansive whore. Perfect. Brass grabbed the wrist pocket he'd set out on the nightstand. It was a segmented silver bracelet with two blue gems embedded into one of the segments. After taking a moment to make sure it was secure on his wrist, he picked up the nail he'd made that afternoon, lit it, and took a long drag. After a few hits, he could feel a shielding fog starting to creep over his brain. What is that? Ruby asked, not recognizing the smell of the smoke. Brass blinked then realized she was talking to him. A precautionary blend I came up with. If this thing's got any kind of charm up its sleeve, it's not going to work on me. She eyed the nail with renewed interest. You plan on sharing that? Nope, he said, putting it out. Dull's reaction time, and we can't risk ruining your performance. So what if it tries to mess with my head? she asked. She was trying to come off as annoyed but she was talking a little faster now, a twinge of fear in her dry demeanor. Killer's been targeting trolls, he said simply. You're not the troll tonight, remember? Ruby sighed, twirling her hair around her fingers. Maybe I should charge double for this. Someone tries to kill me, I'll make it triple, Brass offered. Like any man or woman in her profession, Ruby had learned to mask her feelings but everyone had their tell. When she was scared, her eyes started jittering like an animal looking for predators. When Brass noticed, his cocky smile dropped. He took her hand in his, surprising her. It took him a moment to find his words through the fog in his mind. Nothing is going to happen to you tonight, he promised her. For a moment, Ruby's facade dropped. Not completely, but enough for him to know she believed him. She composed herself, hardening her exterior. Well, are we doing this or what? she asked. Brass's smile returned, and he offered Ruby his arm. Together they left the lilac, taking a ride in a covered carriage. Their destination was Gargan's, an upscale tavern in the Pale, famous for its fine food and extreme discretion. According to Vera, someone, or something, was killing escorts in the pale. Mostly men, but at least one woman. The story was that they'd get hired, or lured off, and then they'd turn up a few days later dead in a gutter. The watch wasn't looking too deeply into things, as per the usual arrangement in the pale. The watch had enough problems to worry about in the stays, and when some of the extra services businesses in the pale provided their clientele were less than legal, it was usually more cost-efficient for owners to wave the watch off and sort things out themselves. Vera had an investigator looking into it. They'd managed to figure out that the culprit was some kind of shape-changer operating out of Gargans. But then the investigator ended up dead in a gutter, too. Brass and Ruby arrived a few hours before sunset and were ushered inside by a well-dressed serving boy. The boy took one look at the two of them, and Brass knew he was coming to the exact conclusion about their relationship that Brass wanted him to. All that time spent in the mirror had paid off. Despite the fact that the sun was still up and shining outside, the interior of Gargan's was kept dim with thick curtains and minimal lights. Except for the foyer where guests waited to be seated, the entire place was absent of natural light. Unlike most places in the Pale, which used lightstone, Gargan's used oil lamps. It gave the place a warm, natural glow that magical light fixtures always struggled to imitate. It was the flicker of the flames that did it. Lightstone's glow was just too constant and clean to give the right atmosphere. Ruby was asked where she'd like to sit, and, with a glance at Brass, if she'd be needing a room this evening. She played her role perfectly, requesting a room like she was speaking a secret code. When someone came to take their order, she ordered for the both of them. A genuine smile began to spread across her face. 
she was enjoying the role reversal. Brass was doubly glad for how well she took to it. The drugs had dulled his normally silver tongue. The weight of the deception was on her, and she was carrying it marvelously. He was staring, and she noticed. Did I fuck something up? What? No, no, not at all, he said. He searched for the right words as memories of another face and another time drifted into his head. It's just been a while since I've met somebody so good at this. So what happens now? she asked. We uh, keep an eye out for anyone staring at me instead of you. They went through all the motions of having dinner. Brass passed the time by asking Ruby about herself. Occasionally, with less speed and flair than he could have managed sober. He told stories about himself that weren't true. It proved surprisingly hard to make her laugh, and he embraced the challenge. By the time they were done with the dinner, Brass had narrowed it down to one of two people. There was a woman, maybe in her early twenties, who they'd caught staring at Brass and biting her lip more than once. And there was a man, maybe a few years older than Brass, was sitting with a group. He was watching the both of them, but Brass couldn't tell if it was jealousy or hunger in his eyes. Ruby paid for the food and drinks with money Brass had given her, and led Brass upstairs to the room that had been reserved for them. The plan was to spend some time in the room, and for Ruby to leave first. Ideally, it would signal to the killer that she was done with Brass, and he was free and alone. There was no real plan for this part, outside of just waiting for enough time to pass to sell the story that Ruby had gotten her money's worth on her expensive whore. About an hour of killing time later, Ruby collected herself, gave Brass a kiss for good luck, and took her leave. Brass gave it a few minutes, passing the time by idly playing with his shirtlaces and thinking about tits, before he finally got bored and decided he'd probably given it long enough. He was surprised to find Ruby standing just outside the door, ready to walk back in. Good, I caught you, she said. Forget something? Brass asked. Ruby looked him over. He was fully dressed, but the look on her face suggested she wished he wasn't. With one hand on his chest, she pushed him back into the room. Brass raised an eyebrow and smirked, but said nothing as she guided him toward the bed and shut the door behind her. I changed my mind about leaving, she said. The backs of his legs hit the edge of the bed, but he resisted falling back into it for a moment. Round two's gonna cost extra, he said. Money's no object, she assured him breathlessly. Brass cocked his head. Is that so? With a flick of his wrist, Brass activated his wrist pocket. The gems on the bracelet gave a flash of bright light, and a gleaming swept-hilt rapier materialized in Brass's hand. Before Ruby could react, he tumbled backward over the bed, swiping with the blade as he went, and came up on the other side with sword extended. Yikes, that was slow, he said, more to himself than her. Might have taken too many hits earlier. Ruby wailed clutching the stump of her wrist. On the floor, the severed hand's skin was rapidly changing color as it grew in size, and the joints of the fingers swelled and contorted. When she glowered at Brass, her eyes were black. Evening. Since you're clearly not Ruby, allow me to introduce myself, Brass said in greeting. I'm Brass, and you must be the one killing hookers in their spare time. The shape-changer snarled at him as its skin quivered, and Ruby's appearance melted away. Its skin darkened and sagged, becoming a deep, leathery, bluish green. Joints began to look gnarled as the whole body elongated and took on a far bonier appearance. Smooth red hair turned frizzy and silver, rapidly growing out into thick sideburns. The feminine figure gave way to almost unfeasibly broad shoulders, and a hairy barrel chest, largely exposed as tailored clothing turned into tattered rags. Unless he'd accidentally mixed a hallucinogen into his blend from earlier, 
Ross was pretty sure he was dealing with an ochre. That explained the murdering people's companionship routine. If there was one thing ochres hated more than anything, it was people getting laid. Huh, Brass mused. You know, I was kind of expecting a demon. But I guess it really never is them. <laughs> How did you know? The ochre asked in a voice that sounded like it gargled steel scraps. Well, for one thing, Brass said, slowly moving to cut off the ochre's escape out the door. There was no round one. For another, your breath. He never finished the sentence, because the creature lunged for him, grabbing him by the throat. The ochre's bony appearance belied an iron grip and lightning speed. It lifted Brass off his feet, examining him. A snort came from its nostrils as it took in Brass's scent. Taking in his life story from the thousands of smells no human nose could hope to notice that clung to his skin, and the creature's lips curled at the stench. Foreign sands, lingering magic, and the blood of countless slain creatures, to say nothing of the dozens and dozens of lovers. Only one kind of human could be so steeped in such an amalgam of smells. <sighs> Glint chaser. It growled. Guilty! Brass choked out with a welcoming grin on his face. It snarled and heaved, throwing Brass into the wall hard enough to crack the wooden paneling. <laughs> All right, fair enough, he coughed. <laughs> Final warning, then. Come along quietly, or I'll... The ochre tackled him into the wall. This time, the boards splintered apart behind him, giving way to open air. Monster and man fell out of the hole in the building and through the air, tangled around each other in a shower of wooden planks and dirt insulation. Outside, heads immediately turned to see what all the fuss was about. Brass and the ochre hit the ground, splitting apart on impact and tumbling away from each other. The monster landed in a crouch, fingers digging into the pavement, ready to pounce. Brass ended up on his back, waiting for the world to stop spinning. Ow! The crowd began to part around them, but few people ran outright, instead sticking around to watch what looked like it would make for a good show. Very few people in the pale had ever learned proper self-preservation. No one even shouted for the watch. Brass rolled his eyes as he caught his breath. The ochre was furious now. Letting out a roar like a wild animal, it charged. Brass was still getting to his feet, and the drugs were slowing him down more than he'd expected. He braced for impact, but just before the creature got within striking distance, there was a sound like glass shattering underwater, and its head whipped to the side, struck by a barely visible force. Brass took the opportunity to get in a thrust with his sword, drawing blood and forcing the creature back. From out of the crowd of onlookers, Armin stepped forward. In one hand, he carried a metal wand just over a foot long with a rotating cylinder built into it just above the handle. The tip of the wand crackled with bright white energy. Phoenix, Brass said, we've got to stop meeting like this. Look out, he yelled. Brass reacted too late and got knocked across the pavement again skidding to a halt at the feet of a visibly concerned elderly woman in a fur coat. While Brass assured her everything was under control, Armin aimed his wand and fired off another blast that struck the creature in the chest. It recoiled from the pain, retreating from both of them. The sound of reinforcements coming could be heard over the din of the crowd, someone's private security, or maybe even the watch. They were seconds away. The ochre looked around frantically, like a cornered animal its eyes locked on the two glint chasers that stood in its way, and it extended a bony finger at them. Serve me, it crooned, beckoning them forward with its finger. Brass felt a dull pressure in his forehead, but little else. The blend did its job perfectly. He was too high to be charmed. Next to him, Armin lowered his wand, and his eyes glazed over. Brass stared at him, annoyed. You've got to be kidding me. Armin pointed his wand at Brass. Brass turned his sword on Armin. Oh, it's been a minute since we've done this, Brass said, 
bracing himself for a fight. He knew firsthand how much pain that wand could dish out. That's quite enough, a new voice announced. Hundreds of glowing blue threads lashed out from the crowd. They wrapped around armor. They wrapped around his wand. They wrapped around brass and the ochre and street lamps. Then they all pulled taut. Armin, brass, and the ochre were all lifted off the ground as the threads pulled tight around them. Wherever they touched the threads, their bodies tingled. The ochre thrashed and wailed, which only made the threads bite into its flesh more, enough to draw blood. Brass remained motionless, knowing better. Armin was still, staring off into space with a stupefied look on his face. Three heavily armed individuals bearing the insignia of the Seven Gates of Sassel marched forward. Knights, royally sanctioned protectors of Corsar, and from the order that protected the kingdom's capital city, no less. Leading them was a pale, beige-skinned woman with short, dark blue hair and matching eyes. She was adorned in flowing robes with glyphs stitched into the trim that glowed the same bright blue as the threads holding everyone in place. Each thread originated from the fingers of her right hand, which was currently clenched in a fist. Well, if it isn't the star breakers, the woman said, I thought you broke up. Ink, Brass said in greeting, a long time no see. Twelve. History. Ink unclenched her fist, and the threads around Brass and Armin loosened until they were gently deposited onto the ground. The threads around the ochre held, and the knights with Ink moved to encircle it and begin the process of manacling the creature. For the record, I had that under control, Brass stated, pointing at the ochre with his sword. I'm sure you did, Ink said. With a flourish and a flash of light, Brass returned his sword to the wrist pocket. So, to what do we owe the pleasure? I could ask you the same thing, Ink said, glancing at the ochre. Care to explain? The knights had managed to secure a pair of manacles on the ochre, but it was still struggling, even as the threads of Ink's spell bit into its flesh with every thrash. I'm working, Brass said. Me too, she retorted. She looked at Armin. And you? Armin said nothing still staring into space. After a moment, Ink realized what was the matter. A smile curled across her face as she savored the moment, before she finally snapped her fingers, and the charm on Armin's mind was dispelled. Brass, be careful, he said, before taking in his surroundings with confusion. After a moment, he growled. It charmed me. Like a brunette in a backless dress. Brass confirmed. Armin rubbed the back of his neck. He hated when that happened. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed the blue-haired wizard, and, though he didn't want to, acknowledged her. Ink. Phoenix. The Academy sent you. Word travels fast. You could say that, Armin said. I was the one who found out about the shield. Wait, what about the shield? Brass asked. He was ignored. Well, uh, thank you for doing the groundwork. The Academy will be taking over from here, obviously, Ink stated. With the ochre subdued, Ink had become the focus of the onlookers. Lightstone, potions, these were fairly common in the Pale. But spellcasting on this level was beyond what most people had ever seen, or that some even thought possible. For the people here, this was a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. Official business, move along, Ink told the crowd. Some of them glanced at each other. Few actually left. Ink grew impatient. Her eyes crackled with blue energy, and her voice boomed with supernatural volume. Now! The crowd dispersed in a hurry. She turned to brass. I'll take the ochre off your hands as well. Unless that's a problem. It's all yours, Brass said. This one was on the house anyway. Well, boys, love to stay and chat, but I'm late for a meeting with the Castellan, Ink said. We should catch up sometime, though. It's been too long. She lowered her hand, and the threads extending from it vanished. 
the ochre, who by now was in chains many times over, hit the ground and immediately began wriggling and thrashing, to no avail. The knights hauled the creature to its feet and began leading it away. Ink followed them, blowing Armin and Brass a kiss as she left. Good seeing you. Brass watched her go. Well, first you, then Ink. This has been a day. Yeah, Armin agreed. He tried to think of something to say. This was only his second time talking to Brass in seven years. The last time, a few days ago, Brass had started the conversation, and Darman had ended up telling him in so many words that he wanted nothing to do with him. He wasn't sure how to turn around and ask for help. Agonizing over his first sentence, Armin didn't realize Brass was already walking away. Well, I'll just get out of your hair now. Brass, wait. Can't. Busy. Brass. This is about those guys who attacked you. Brass kept walking. Armin followed. This is important. Brass spun on his heel. Armin was impressed at how he managed that with the kind of boots he was wearing. Maybe I'm doing something important too, Brass retorted. Brass, I'm serious. So am I. It's called an actual life, Brass said, turning back around with an exaggerated wave goodbye. Good luck with whatever your thing is. I deserve that. Deserved what? Brass paused. He glanced over his shoulder, but thought better of it. Ah, never mind. Build a dick and fuck yourself with it. Armin growled in frustration. He had one shot left to try and convince Brass. If it didn't work, he'd visit Clock Tower by himself. Brass, I need your help. Brass stopped dead in his tracks. He didn't just look over his shoulder. He made a show of it, bending backwards and revealing a coy expression. Armin immediately regretted this. Oh? Brass twirled around to face him again. You need my help? Whatever would a respectable family man like yourself need the help of a glint chaser for? I told you it's about the people who attacked you, Armin said. Two days ago, I was attacked. Oh, I see, Brass said, drawing out each word. When I'm attacked, I can go fuck myself. But when it happens to you, I should drop whatever I'm doing to come lend a hand. It's not like that. It was, but that wasn't the sort of thing to admit while asking for help. A week before people came after you, the Golden Shield was attacked in their home, right here in Olwen. I think it's all connected. I think someone is targeting freelancers. I thought you didn't do this anymore, Brass said. Aren't you too good for this sinful world now, or something? Brass, please, Armin begged. One job. That's all I need your help for. Brass pursed his lips, thinking. Armin suspected he'd already made up his mind, and was just drawing this out to fuck with him now. I will help you, Brass declared, on one condition. What do you want? You help me first. I've got a job of my own. What is it? Finding a trull. What's yours? Armin almost wanted to give Brass a chance to renegotiate. I need to get into Clock Tower. Oh, Brass's mouth held the O shape, and his eyebrows shot up. Well, that's way bigger than mine. Thirteen. Clock Tower. The next day, Armin met Brass back in the Lilac's lobby. Armin dug into a pouch on his belt and produced a leather wristband that incorporated an engraved metal disc in its center that gave off a soft white glow. He handed it to Brass. As fast on the delivery as ever, Brass said, putting the wristband on. He started fiddling with it, tapping the disc, squeezing its edges, tugging on the band. How do I turn it on? Phoenix grabbed Brass's wrist and ran his finger around the edge of the disc. A white ring of energy materialized around Brass's head and passed over him from head to toe. As it did, his entire appearance changed. His bright purple jacket became a dull gray. 
The fabric took on a coarse, worn-out appearance. The rest of his clothes underwent a similar roughing up. His face changed entirely, and his tan skin tone shifted to a pale one. His hair darkened and straightened, and a small goatee appeared on his chin. I still say we should have gone practical, Brass stated, staring down at himself. Illusions always feel weird. It literally feels like nothing. That's the problem, Brass said. Did you give me a hat? No. Well, Brass copied Armin's earlier movement, running his finger around the edge of the wristband's disc. A white ring passed over him again. He looked exactly the same as before, except now he was sporting a stovepipe hat. Brass, it's an illusion. The hat'll give you away. You are no fun, Brass said, but he complied. He activated the wristband again, removing the hat from his illusory disguise. Thank you, Armin said. Stop messing with it. It's only got a few charges. He traced a pattern on his bracer, triggering the disguise spell on himself as well. The two of them took a walk into the stays, one of the parts of Olwen built up by the massive influx of settlers from the north. Olwen had always had a cobbled-together air to it, but the stays in particular looked and felt like an entirely different city had been haphazardly stitched onto it. Everything was smaller here. Taverns in the stays were barely the size of houses in the crest. Narrow roads were made to feel even narrower by the river of bodies that choked them. Even the people, so many of them comprised of the recently displaced, seemed to try to make themselves as small as possible. Finding Clock Tower's hideouts and picking the best one to drop in on had taken up most of Brass's evening. What started with seducing a waiter from Gargan's to get their blood smoke supplier had sort of spiraled out of control and ended with paying someone twenty glint to throw eggs at a city watch station while he peeked at their files. But in the end, he'd gotten what they needed. He'd also gotten charged with trespassing and escaping custody, but he didn't tell Armin that part. And you're sure this is the right place? Armin asked. Have a little faith, Brass said. When have I ever let you down? Constantly. I meant when it counted. Once. Armin did his best not to think about that. Those memories wouldn't be of any use to them right now. They came to a stop outside a squat earth brick building with large windows that exposed its bright interior of chairs and mirrors. Displays showing off various bottles and cases sat in the window. Above the door hung a sign that read, Clean-cut looks, above an engraving of scissors and a razor. We're here, Brass announced, waltzing inside. The shop's large windows allowed light to pour inside from every direction, and the floor was almost spotlessly swept. Most of the chairs were empty, save for one where a man was receiving a shave. The barber was a tall man with a sizable paunch, receding hairline, and a thick mustache. Afraid it's just me today, sirs, he greeted them without looking up from his work. Something I could do for you? Actually, I'm in need of a close shave, Brass said, making a show of scratching his ear as he did. The barber looked up now. Brass had caught his attention. Going for the Yandron style? Whatever makes the missus happy, Brass answered. The barber nodded. An unspoken test passed. Be right with you. When the barber was finished and his lone customer was gone, he led Armin and Brass to a set of cellar doors in the back of the shop. He opened them, revealing a set of stairs that went down much farther than they would have had to if this were a normal cellar. At the bottom... Armin could just make out a long corridor that winded off into darkness. Thank you very much, good sir, Brass said, leading the way down. The barber closed the door behind them, leaving them in total darkness. Armin produced the light stone from his belt, illuminating the stairwell in faint white light. Wordlessly, they descended the stairs. It was cold in the passageway and dark except for the light emanating from the light stone. The stench of dirt and old wood hung in the air, which was uncomfortably still. Why was it? Armin wondered, 
but nobody these days seemed to know how to properly ventilate an underground tunnel for decent airflow. Then, in a moment of self-awareness, Armin realized the fact that he was thinking about tunnel ventilation at a time like this was probably why his wife called him easily distracted. This brings back memories, Brass said, smiling. Wandering around in the dark, trying to get ourselves killed? Sneaking into the bad guy's house, finding secrets, saving lives, Brass said. I mean, we're saving our lives this time, but same idea. I guess it's also different without everybody else here. Brass, Armin stopped walking. I'm just here to make sure that Harbin and the Watch can handle this. Oh, I know, Brass said with a wave of his hand. But what's the plan when they can't? The corridor ended at a wooden door. Orange light seeped out through the crack between it and the floor. A muffled hum of music came from the other side, as did the smell of pipe smoke. Brass raised his eyebrows and gave a tight-lipped smile. He opened the door, and the corridor was flooded with light. Inside was a spacious room with a vaulted ceiling and glass chandelier light bathing the whole interior in an orange tinge that filtered through the subtle haze of smoke in the air. Wooden booths and tables filled most of the space, save for a bar counter at the far end and an aisle in the center that led to a thrust stage. Most of the seating in the room was filled by men and women dressed for a scrape with the odd person dressed in finery mixed in every so often. On stage, front and center, was a woman draped in a trailing scarlet dress, singing a song of heartbreak, while the band behind her strummed out a melancholic accompaniment. A doorman with curly red hair and a scraggly chin moved to intercept them. He kept his hands behind his back, but his posture sent a message that they weren't to come any farther. Some I can do for you, gentlemen. Winston, Brass said, recognizing the man. I know you? Brass realized his error too late. He'd forgotten he was disguised right now. Armin really wanted to hit him now, but Brass recovered. No, but your reputation precedes you. Who hasn't heard of the fire chin of Faithwater? What? Winston asked in disbelief even as he broke out in a smile. Nah, they're not still telling that story, are they? Well, I've heard it, Brass said. Never expected to see you here. Place is full of surprises, Winston said. Sorry, what were you here for again? Ah, just looking for work, Brass said. I understand this is the kind of place where we could be pointed in the right direction. The doorman looked them over and seemed impressed. You're in the right place. Find yourselves a seat. The dial will take you when he's ready. Perfect, Brass said. What did you say your name was? Oh, pardon my manners. I forgot to give it, Brass said. You can call me Copper, and this is my associate, Shaft. Armin suppressed the urge to punch Brass in the face, it wouldn't have been worth it to try, even if it didn't risk blowing their cover. Brass was always quicker than he was. Shaft, huh? Winston asked, giving Armin another once-over. I can assure you it's a name well earned, Brass stated, before giving Armin an encouraging slap on the ass. Come on, let's find a table. Once they sat down, out of anyone else's earshot, Armin glowered at Brass. What was that? You're going to have to be more specific. Shaft. All part of the ruse. No one will suspect the well-endowed gay hitman of being clock tower enemy number one. Well, number 23, realistically. They've got a lot of enemies, Brass said. You couldn't think of a better name, could you? I blanked like a university kid on an entrance exam, Brass said. But hey, it's not an entirely inaccurate name. Armin cocked his head. He wasn't sure he wanted an explanation of what Brass meant. What are you talking about? Brass smirked. Snow used to tell me everything. Oh, saints, very respectable by the sounds of things. Please stop. 
This was not happening. He was not discussing the size of his penis with his ex-companion in the middle of an undercover operation. Brass chuckled, but eventually seemed to settle down. He turned his eyes to the stage, taken in by the slow swaying of the singer's hips and the raw sadness she projected through her voice. The lyrics only made the performance even more haunting. It was a song about loneliness, self-loathing, and desperation to be someone else. He'd never heard it before, but with one performance, the woman managed to make him feel like he'd remember every word for the rest of his life. You hear from her lately? Brass asked abruptly. His voice shrank, taking on a wistful quality. Who? Snow. Armin was silent for a moment. Not since Ralgan. You? Once, right after everything went down, Brass said. These days it's just rumors and word of mouth. A dead noble here, a guy freezing to death in summer there. Oh. Armin tried to come up with something else to say, but he couldn't figure out what the appropriate response was. It had taken him months to be able to talk to even Elizabeth about how the Starbreakers had ended. Still, the city's name left him uncomfortable. He couldn't read Brass. Couldn't tell what he needed to hear. A gruff voice broke their silence. I don't think I recognize either of you two. A tall, broad-shouldered man in dark clothes loomed over their table. He had fair skin, bleached blonde hair, and calloused hands. The predatory smile on his face made Armin want to reach for his wand. The man was flanked on either side by brick houses of men dressed in chainmail with short swords on their belts. Brass immediately stood up, and Armin followed suit. You must be the dial, Brass said. Coppa, a pleasure to meet you. Sit, the man said. They obeyed, but Brass cocked his head for a moment at the dial's brusqueness. Both of the dial's bodyguards remained standing. Winston tells me that you're looking for work, the dial said, eyeing them both. That we are, Brass nodded. A rather specific kind, actually. What specific kind is that? Well, my partner and I are rather experienced swords for hire, Brass said. Got our start as glint chasers, but Castellan bounties weren't cutting it and digging up old tombs and ruins always felt hmm, wrong. So we transitioned. The dial nodded his understanding, his eyes flitting between the two of them. We heard there was a contract out on a bunch of freelancers worth looking into, Armin said, cutting to the chase. We figured this would be the place to get the details on that. That is not one of ours, the dial said, but I have heard of it. It's a large list. Different pay for the different names on it. What names? Armin asked. I have someone who can tell you, the dial said. Without needing to be prompted, one of the dial's men left. Of course he didn't know himself, Armin thought. Remembering details was a thinking man's role. This dial was a brute. The crime lord continued to stare at both of them, eyes narrowing occasionally. A warning the dial said. You are not the first to ask about this contract. You will have competitors. I like a little competition, Brass said. Yes, the dial said. The corner of his mouth twitched as he nodded again. He'd made up his mind about them. He gestured to the stage. Have you enjoyed tonight's performance? She's phenomenal, Brass said. She's Antimer, the dial said, like he was hungry and talking about an expertly cooked meal. Yandrians invented the stage, but Antimer were born to it. They're a dishonest people by nature, perfect for the illusion of performance. Alarm bells rang in Armin's head. The dial's choice of words worried him, but he couldn't be certain he was imagining it. It took a sharp and practiced eye to see through illusions. No, it had to be a coincidence. She came to me not too long ago, the dial said. He sounded particularly proud about that. 
I knew at once there was something magical about her. She's certainly talented, Armin said, trying to maintain his cool. Probably could have been an opera singer. Are you a patron of the operas? The dial asked. Armin instantly regretted opening his mouth. Brass was so much better at this than he was. I stayed in Neandria when I was younger. Armin could never come up with a fake story on the spot, so he figured his best bet was just cherry-picking the truth. There were a lot of operas. I never had the chance to attend a Neandrian production, but their reputation precedes them. The dial stood. I have others I must meet with, but please, enjoy a drink with my compliments. On the wife's tab, sir, one of the dial's enforcers asked. She won't mind the expense, he said, eliciting a knowing nod in response. The exchange reminded Armin of Brass's conversation with the barber. Brass kicked him under the table in a warning that confirmed his worst suspicions. They were made. He'd underestimated the dial and overestimated himself. The dial was leaving the table. His man wasn't. As he walked, he gave small, subtle signals that Armin never would have seen if he didn't already have an idea of what was happening. A nod to one person, a handshake and whisper to another, and the entire atmosphere shifted. People got out of their seats. Someone walked on stage to escort the singer off. Both Armin and Brass started counting just how many other people were in the room. Maybe it was because he was with Brass, or because he'd actually brought his wand this time. But old instincts came to Armin even easier than they had last time, like they'd never left. The focus as everything that wasn't right in front of him fell out of his mind. The unambiguity that turned the threat of death into a puzzle, and everything around him into pieces of a solution. Two of them, too many enemies, six already standing with easy paths straight toward them. Only one exit. Unobstructed, but not for long. Brass made a move for the door, and Phoenix was right behind him. They weren't quick enough. A line of men formed in front of the only exit. People were beginning to draw weapons. Phoenix cursed himself for not keeping a better eye on the exit, for coming prepared with an alternate escape route. He really was out of practice. I've heard stories of the glint chasers who set the clock back by decades, the dial said from a table where he now sat, watching the rest of the hideout encircled them. I never imagined that they'd be so foolish as to come here, or think they could fool me with parlor tricks. The first of the lot stepped forward, eager to be the first to draw blood. This is for what you did back. The woman never finished her sentence. In a single motion, Brass activated his wrist pocket to summon his rapier and swung. The woman gurgled as a line of red appeared on her throat and started to leak profusely. She collapsed, and the rest of the crowd was stunned to stillness. They had never seen a person move that fast. I'm Brass, by the way, Brass told the woman as she twitched on the floor. Sorry for doing that out of order, but you didn't leave me much time. He threw his arms open wide, swinging his rapier out as he did. Everyone near the sword took an instinctive step back, their fear would last maybe another second before turning to revenge, Brass knew, unless he could distract them. Well, who wants to go next? Brass asked. The challenge threw them off balance. It put the idea in their minds, if only for an instant, that they would have to fight him one at a time. It wouldn't take long at all for them to realize they could just rush them. Even he wasn't sure he could take that many dirks coming at once. Anyone? Come on, step up. You haven't got all day. His mouth was moving faster than his mind now. He trusted it to catch up before he got himself killed. Phoenix watched, tense, but dared not get in Brass's way. The crowd parted as one man shoved his way through. He stood ahead above anyone else in the room, and he was clad in heavy plate armor. His face was crisscrossed with scars, and one of his ears was a mangled mess. He had a sword only slightly shorter than Brass was tall in hand, dragging the tip across the floor. Scratched all along the surface of the blade 
or tick marks. Brass couldn't count how many. Just one, Brass declared, pointing with his sword. The challenger approached no farther, eyeing Brass's blade. Brass knew he was being sized up, but now he had a plan. I guess the rest of you must know what my partner is carrying. Phoenix hesitated, but only for a second. He remembered this play. It had been a very long time since he'd enchanted something this fast. He reached into the belt pouch that carried his spare parts and produced the small stone sphere. At the same time, he quickly traced his fingers across it in a series of rapid patterns. By the time he held up the stone to the crowd around them, it was emitting a pulsing red glow, while angry-looking glyphs slowly moved across its surface. Shaft, Brass shouted. For the uneducated in the room, tell them what they've won. This is a class four fire sphere, Phoenix warned, making sure to show it to everyone surrounding them. With a dead man activation glyph. In Corson for the slow folks in the back? If this thing leaves my hand, it'll explode in a fireball that'll take out this entire block and everyone in it. You heard the man, the entire block. Brass said. I commend you all for good instincts, seeing as if any of you had been stupid enough to take another step forward, we would have been forced to incinerate us all. Show of hands. Who wants to be incinerated? No one raised their hand. Now, this is what's going to happen, Brass said. We're going to walk out of here. You're going to give us a thirty-second head start. Sixty seconds, Phoenix interrupted. A forty-five second head start, Brass said, and then you can all do your darndest to catch us. Or you can pack up your little operation before the watch, who are already on their way, get here. Brass and Phoenix both began inching toward the exit while everyone looked on, unsure of what to do. It didn't matter if they actually stuck to the terms Brass had laid out. If they got out of the room and into the passageway, they could bottleneck the crowd and even the odds. They got to the line of men blocking the door without anyone making a move against them. Brass gestured with his sword for the men to get out of their way. Hesitantly, they began to move. The king's man doesn't work with glint chasers, the man with the enormous sword said. He pointed at the stone in Armin's hand. And that is a rock. Well, I encourage you to test that theory, Brass said. Brass grabbed the rock out of Phoenix's hand and threw it at the man. Everyone else in the room flinched, expecting a ball of fire. Instead, the rock simply smacked the man in the eye and clattered to the floor. While everyone was still in shock, Brass attacked, and in the space of a breath, killed two men guarding the door. Phoenix drew his wand from his belt. The cylinder in the base of the wand spun cycled through its chambers, and clicked into position. The light at the tip of the wand changed from white to red, an instant before a jet of flame spewed forward, engulfing part of the crowd. It didn't destroy the entire block, but it threw the ranks of the enemies closest to them into chaos. Now with an opening to the exit, Phoenix and Brass sprinted out, while curses and crossbow bolts followed them. They reached the stairs, a chorus of footsteps behind them, Phoenix sent out another jet of flame from the wand, covering their retreat as they ascended the stairs. Brass shoved open the cellar doors at the top of the staircase and slammed them shut the moment Phoenix was clear. Phoenix aimed his wand at the doors, but before he could do anything, crackling blue threads of energy materialized around the handles of the cellar doors, wrapping around them and pulling tight. The doors jostled as people on the other side tried to open them, but the threads held firm and the doors stayed shut. For someone supposedly retired, you get into a lot of trouble, Ink said, standing at the far end of the alleyway with a smirk on her face. They met in a tavern, will resume after this short message from the ChemCat team. Hey there, lovers of story. 
Do you find this book unputdownable? Are you itching to hear how it ends? Would you like to have a copy you can keep forever? This week, CamCat Unwrapped is hosting a giveaway. One lucky winner will receive the audiobook of They Met in a Tavern for free. All you have to do to enter is subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, or newsletter and answer a quick survey, all of which are linked in our bio. Each new subscription is one entry. That's it. It's that easy. Soon, you could have your favorite CamCat audiobook in your ears and at your fingertips. So make sure you enter for your chance to win this book to live in. Enjoy! Fourteen. Ink. Can we not do this here? Phoenix asked, as the cellar doors shuddered again. Obviously, Ink said, rolling her eyes. Let's go for a ride. Ink spread her hands out, and a circle of iridescent glyphs appeared on the cobblestone where they were standing. A shiver went down Phoenix's spine, as a slick feeling slowly encased him. Brass looked down at the glyphs, then at himself. He could feel it, too, like being submerged in cold oil. Everything around them took on a shimmering fractal appearance. Colors around them changed. Images blurred. The sound of thousands of glasses shattering drowned out all noise. Then, all at once, everything returned to normal. Only now, they were standing in the lobby of the Crimson Lilac. The woman at the front desk yelped, nearly dropping her book. The only evidence of the teleport was the faint smell of ozone and the churning in their stomachs. The cellar doors and clock tower were on the other side of the city. They were in the clear. A tension Phoenix hadn't realized he was feeling relaxed, and the need to be Phoenix faded away with it. Armin did his best to steady himself. Brass doubled over. Teleporting. Brass said. That's a sensation I forgot I hated. If the teleport affected Ink, she didn't show it, as she smiled and waited for Brass and Armin to recover. She was watching them both expectantly. The woman at the desk was staring at all of them as if she wasn't sure they were real. Not that we don't appreciate the assistance, Armin said, trying to be diplomatic. But what do you want? I said we should catch up didn't I? I didn't think you were serious, Armin said. How did you find us? As soon as he asked it, he felt stupid. She could have teleported them anywhere, but she'd picked the lilac. She knew they'd be here last night. The smile on her face only confirmed it for him. She'd scryed on them. We should talk, Ink said. Drinks are on me. Armin could still feel his heart pounding from the incident with Clock Tower. He wanted to sit down and process everything that had just happened. He didn't want to deal with ink and whatever it was she wanted. And she wanted something. But there was really only one way to get rid of her. Fine, Armin said. The three of them sat down in the lilacs bar and ordered drinks. Armin made a point of ordering the most expensive whiskey the bar sold. He didn't drink it. He knew it wouldn't hurt ink's coin purse. Not with the Academy's money behind her but it was the principle that mattered to him. What do you want? Armin asked again. Has he gotten Mina? Ink asked Brass. You know, I thought that exact thing, but I didn't know if I was misremembering, so I didn't say anything. Armin briefly reconsidered not drinking. Misremember? So the gang really did split up after Relgan, Ink said. I didn't believe it when I heard it. Well, things happen, people change, you move on, Brass said, looking at Armin. There was no judgment in Brass's eyes. If anything, there was concern. Brass had a vague sense of where to draw the line when talking about the old days. Ink wouldn't. You understand. You're not still with the cord, after all. No, I'm not, Ink said. She let out a forlorn sigh. 
I do miss that bunch sometimes. But I'd gone as far as they could take me. Which brought you here, Armin said, hoping to steer things back to her actual reason for being here. He thanked the saints it worked. That it did, Ink said, turning on her seat to face her whole body toward him now. I came to ask you some questions about the Golden Shield. I already told Harbin everything I know. Harbin's a wheelwright out of his depth, Ink said dismissively. I need to hear this from someone who half knows what they're talking about. His fingers curled, but he stopped himself short of making a fist. Ink lived to get a rise out of people, and he didn't want to give her the satisfaction. Armin had spent most of his life as the smartest person in the room and feeling isolated for it. People's eyes glazed over when he talked too much or too in-depth about his projects. Getting excited about a historical discovery only made him realize how much of an outlier he was for knowing the old world's history of succession. Things other people were amazed by were mundane, basic principles of study to him. It all just made his existing problems of understanding people even worse. Ink was in the same boat as he was, separated from other people by how much she knew. But she reveled in it, looked down on anyone who couldn't mash her. Of course she didn't value Harbin's version of events. Harbin hadn't studied arcane theory and old-world scholarship for fifteen years. What did he know? Okay, he said, doing his best to keep his voice level. The Golden Shield? Two assailants attacked them. An artifact was damaged in the fight and caused an explosion that killed all of them. Armin knew for a fact Harbin would have told her this already. The assailants? Ink asked. Couldn't find their bodies, Armin said flatly. Incinerated in the blast? Not likely. Three other bodies survived, including one from the epicenter. So someone recovered their bodies, Ink said. Not a question. She'd already come to a conclusion. Maybe the wrong one, Armin thought. Or they survived, Armin said. Survived an explosion that destroyed a whole house? It's not impossible, Armin said. Fire resistance, teleportation, dumb luck. Ink leaned back, observing Armin with a much more reserved smile than her usual one, much as she enjoyed dismantling blatantly wrong ideas. Armin had convinced her of the possibility. She was impressed. It wasn't often someone else thought of something she didn't think was wrong. The artifact that was destroyed, she changed the subject. What was it? You tell me, Armin said. The shield worked for you. They worked for the academy, Ink said. Since when are you modest, Armin asked. There aren't too many people in the academy who don't answer to the high inquisitive. Ink chuckled, running her hand along the glyphs on the sleeves of her robes. Well done. I forgot you could read Arcania. You don't seem to be doing too bad for yourself, either. Armin's smile dropped. He'd meant it as a power move, showing how much he knew about Ink and her work. He hadn't expected her turning it on him. She looked very deliberately at his hand, at his wedding ring. So, which of those poor girls did you finally pick? Or did you convince them to share? His legs shook. Stupid. He'd brought Ink's life into this, and now she was bringing in his. Should have known better. Are you here about the shield or me? Armin asked. Both, actually. His heart rate picked up. This wasn't the answer she was supposed to give. Ink's smile got bigger again. He'd done a terrible job of hiding his discomfort. What happened to the artifact? Ink asked. Destroyed. What about the head? The what? Brass stopped drinking Armin's whiskey to interject for the first time. Gamma's still with me, Armin said. I've been trying to repair him. That construct is Academy property, Ink said. Well, right now he's the Academy's paperweight, Armin said. Damage from the blast rendered him inert. I can fix him. Besides, I already told you everything he told me. It has more information, Ink said. Information 
it won't tell you. Well, he's not going to tell you either, Armin said, unless I can get him working again. Ink narrowed her eyes. You know, Harbin thinks you're retired. I am. You're not acting like it. Brass was actively paying attention to their conversation now, as he sipped Armin's drink. He wasn't sure how Armin would react to Ink pushing that button, but he was anxious to see. Armin breathed. I'm just trying to keep the people I care about safe, Armin said. The Golden Shield weren't the only ones attacked. The assailants aren't the only ones out there. Fair enough, Ink said. She stood up and placed a coin pouch on the counter. Armin could tell at a glance she'd overpaid. Deliver the construct's head to the Castellan as soon as it's functional, Ink said. If you get in the way of my investigation, I will haul you and anyone else I feel like into a cell in oblivion and lose the key. She waved her hand, causing the teleportation glyphs to appear under her feet once again. The air started to fracture and shimmer around her. That's a promise from the High Inquisitive of the Academy. With a shattering sound, the air undistorted itself, and ink was gone, leaving behind the faint smell of ozone. Brass waved his hand to clear the smell. Well, <laughs> she's as much of a delight as ever, Brass said, as he counted out the money needed to pay for drinks from Ink's coin pouch and pocketed the rest. You know, they say power corrupts. But what does it do when the person's already a bastard? Armin grabbed his drink, which was half gone already, thanks to Brass, and down the rest in one go. Fifteen. Breakdown. Armin's whole body was shaking, and his heart hammered in his chest as everything played over in his mind, from walking down into Clock Tower's hideout to Ink's exit. The more it played, the more idiotic he felt. Amateur mistakes. Stupid decisions. Stupid. And Elizabeth. And Robin. If he'd made even one more mistake, they'd have never seen him again. Are you feeling okay? No, Brass. Armin ran his hands through his hair. No, I'm not feeling okay. Well, they sell a few fixes for that here, Brass offered. You might want to stick to the drinks, though. Don't think your wife would appreciate it if you... Armin punched Brass in the face. This isn't funny, Brass, Armin shouted. Heat was building in his face and chest. His heart pounded, and he had to stand up. Clearly not, since you opted to talk about it with a right cross. Brass rubbed his jaw. Brass had taken far worse hits. But from Armin, it was a surprise. Saints know how many people are after us, and who knows who else. We don't know, because we tried to find out, and we fucked it up. I almost died. I almost left Elizabeth a widow and Robin without a father. And we didn't even get anything out of it. And now I've got ink and the entire academy breathing down my neck. This whole mess gets worse every day, and I have no idea how to fix it. He sat back down. Yelling had vented some of the heat building up in him, but his legs were shaking again. Again, everything that happened replayed in his mind as he frantically tried to figure out what he could have done, should have done differently. He couldn't afford mistakes. Mistakes were how people died. Brass put a hand on Armin's shoulder. Phoenix, you were right. His voice was gentle, but firm. Something about hearing his old freelancer name refocused Armin. He started breathing slower. Started processing what Brass had said. About what? Brass looked him in the eye. The attacks being connected was just a theory. But the dial said it himself. It's all one contract. You were right. What does that change? Armin asked. How should I know? You're the one who usually does this deduction business, Brass said. Armin glowered. This was supposed to be making him feel better? That's not the point, though, Brass said. The point is, it wasn't for nothing. It's never for nothing. We'll find another way. Figure out what's going on. 
and save everyone. It's what we do. He made it sound so simple. Maybe it was because back in the old days it was that simple, and Brass was still living in those days. Armored could use a little bit of that right now. A little bit of the old him. We? Armin asked. You thought I was going to botch one job and hang you out to dry, Brass said. Rule number one of freelancing, you look out for your company. Besides, that old clock tower mess was the most fun I've had with my clothes on in years. Armin laughed. It was an exhausted, terrified laugh, but it wasn't without comfort. Brass was still brass. In its own way, that was a relief. I'm sorry I punched you, Armin said apologetically. Oh, that was a punch, Brass said. I thought you were tenderly caressing my face. I was very flattered. Armin crossed his arms. He felt a little better. Maybe it was Brass. Maybe it was the alcohol. Probably a bit of both. Brass saw some of the tension release and flashed a knowing smirk. So, it's Elizabeth? For a moment, Armin wondered how Brass knew who he was married to, but then remembered he blurted out her name during his meltdown. He really was doing a terrible job keeping his personal life personal today. Yeah, Armin admitted. I was banned from Sassel. I couldn't face my family. I didn't know where else to go. I just knew I shouldn't be alone. And she put me back together. That's sweet. Why do you say that with a smirk on your face? It's nothing. Angel just owes me twenty glint. You made a bet on me and Elizabeth? Don't act surprised. We bet on all of your relationships back then. And Church always lost, poor bastard. Of course you did, Armin muttered, running his hands through his hair. He thought he'd be more annoyed. And yet he found the thought of his companions doing something like that oddly comforting. His heartbeat steadied even more, and he sighed. Well, clock tower's a bust, and that was our best shot at figuring out where the contract came from. Best shot isn't the same thing as only shot, Brass said. We'll think of something. Or something will fall in our laps. It'll work out. That's not a plan, Brass shrugged. That's because I'm moral support. Plans are your thing. Armin sighed, rubbing his temples. Right, well, I suppose I'll try and think of something. Brass had a point. Clock Tower wasn't the only option. There was at least one person in Harbin's custody who knew about the contract, assuming they'd found the assailant he'd left tied up back at the Golden Shield's house. Three, if the Academy wanted to drop the glint on a couple resurrections. There were other organizations that could be tracked down that might know something. Maybe there were other freelancers who'd been attacked who knew more about what was going on. Armin stood up. Where are you going? Home, Armin said. Until I can find us another lead, I might as well work on getting ink off my back about her construct. And I miss my family. I'll be in touch. Brass rolled his eyes, but smiled. All right, well, off you go then. Swear at baby for me. And tell Wings I said hi. Armin got up to leave and then stopped at the door, debating whether or not to say something. Brass? Hmm? Thank you. Brass looked surprised for a moment, then smiled. He gave his old companion a knowing nod. My pleasure. Sixteen. Carps. By the time Armin made it back to Acres, the late afternoon sun was on its last legs. The long walk had given him time to calm down, think, panic, and then calm down again. Knowing he could count on brass was a small relief. But there was still a lot to deal with. On the way home, he stopped by the inn. It had been a while since he'd checked in on the appliances he'd built for them. And if he didn't do it now, he was going to put it off for another week and after the mess he'd dealt with, he could use a simpler task to settle himself. Carp's Inn was the center of Acres, 
the place where everyone in the small homestead gathered after a long day's work, and where travelers were welcomed into town. It was a wide building, but short for something that had rooms upstairs. Most of the tables were wood, but the counters were polished stone. Walls were decorated with pieces of old farming equipment and artisan's tools donated by the different families. Everyone in Acres had a piece of something in the inn. Behind the counter was one of Armin's contributions, a slab of dark gray stone where a cooking stove should have been. Pots and pans rested on it, and where they were placed, bright orange arcane glyphs appeared, heating them. It was busy and warm when Armin walked in, and the smell of stewed beef and chili wafted through the place. There was no table or booth where there weren't at least two people sitting. No one sat alone in this place. Planks and clatters of mugs and cutlery punctuated the chatter that filled the room. An older man with a dark complexion and graying hair walked by Armin, carrying a platter of empty tankards on one hand. Armin! Hey, Ferris, said Armin. Carp's out back getting some from the chiller, said Ferris. Go ahead and sit down by the bar. He'll find you. Thanks, Armin nodded and sat down. A few minutes passed during which Armin kept himself busy by taking some spare odds and ends from his belt pouches and tinkering with them. Are you making me a new marvel? A man's laughing voice drew Armin back to reality. There was only one person in Acres who spoke Jippik with a voice like that. Carp was an older Jippik man with rich brown skin, dark hair, and chocolate eyes. He was a hairy fellow with a thick beard and hair across his forearms that his rolled-up sleeves showed off. His clothes had been white once, but years of wear and work in the inn had tinted them a slight yellow-brown color. He hugged Armin, almost lifting him out of his chair. Armin returned the embrace, even if he couldn't match Carp's strength. Carp spoke Corson, but he preferred the languages of his homeland and early travels and indulged in them whenever he could. Besides Carp's husband, Armin was the only person Carp could converse with in it. Just some trinket, Armin said. I suppose I can make do with what you've already done, Carp said, finally releasing him. It's been a while since I've seen you. How's your beautiful family? Happy and healthy, thanks, Armin said. I was headed back to them, but I wanted to make sure things were good here. Carp nodded enthusiastically. The stove works perfectly. I never get tired of watching newcomers touch it for the first time. No matter how many times you show them, they're always sure it will burn them. He poked Armin in the chest. A man traveling for his master saw it and wanted to buy it. I told him if he wanted one, he would have to speak to you. Armin got worried for a moment. You didn't tell him where to find me, did you? Of course not, Carp assured him. I told him, if you want one, you must speak with the man who made this one. When he wanted to know who made it, I told him only that I would pass along his message. Armin relaxed. Good man, Carp. If you sold these creations, you could be the richest man in Corsar, Carp said, for not the first time. I don't need the money, Armin replied. So you always say. Carp said, but everyone needs money eventually. How's the chiller? Armin asked, changing the subject. All right, that is something you could take a look at, Carp said. Just this morning, something went wrong with it. Armin raised an eyebrow. Did it stop working? It worked too well, Carp said in amazement. I went to pull ingredients from it this morning, and everything was frozen solid. Armin was genuinely surprised and intrigued by this. The stove and chilling cabinet were experiments of his. When he'd first built them, it had been hard to maintain the enchantment on them, power inefficiencies mostly. But he'd cleared those up. His last few checkups had mostly been to clean them while he worked out the best way to enchant them to sustain and maintain themselves. A surge in effect was new. His mind started concocting possible causes, an accidental cascading effect that increased the power of the enchantment over time. Something destabilizing the flow of energy between planes. Some damn sorcerer sneezing. 
I'll take a look, Armin said. Carp led Armin out back behind the inn, where the chiller was kept. As soon as they stepped outside, the temperature dropped considerably. That was Armin's first clue that something was off. The chiller's interior was supposed to be cold, not the area around it. The chiller was an oversized pantry about the size of a small shed. Its back, a maze of tubing and tanks. At the moment, the grass around it was covered in frost. Armin could see his own breath while standing next to it. Carp left him to it. Armin set his armor to resist the cold, just as a precaution, and then started by examining everything. One thing became readily apparent. The enchantment was surging. Its effects were being amplified by something. But he couldn't find the cause. Phoenix. An icy voice spoke out. Armin turned around as slowly as he could. A woman sat on the roof of Carp's Inn, staring down at him. Her skin was white, tinged blue. She had long black hair, most of it tied back, but some of it free, framing her face and her bright blue eyes. She wore a mix of black and dark blue leather armor. As soon as Armin saw her, he knew why the chiller was acting up. It was snow. 17. Small Beginnings Crackling silver smoke obscured the floor as Phoenix entered the tiny church of the town of Enerwin. He couldn't see his boots, but he still heard his footsteps against the hard wooden floor. And yet, his feet felt wet, and they tingled. There were no candles or lanterns lit inside. The only light came from the soft white glow emanating from the smoke itself. Somewhere in the back of his mind, there was a part of him screaming to run. He was a glorified librarian with a second-hand crossbow on a research trip. What was happening to Enerwin was so thoroughly beyond him, it wasn't even funny. Of the four glint chasers he'd recruited, none of them had signed up to fight a mad cult bent on sacrificing the town to their dark god. But curiosity and adrenaline drove him forward. He'd come to Enerwin to dig through the nearby Old World ruins, making stops in every tavern along the way to look for help until he finally caught a break with four glint chasers about his age, all willing to work with his incredibly limited budget. He'd only had to pay snow and brass. The timid cleric and the angry girl following him around, who gave their names as Church and Angel, were willing to work for free. Apparently, the very ruin Phoenix had wanted to explore was luring too many people to their deaths. Church wanted it cleared out, and for whatever reason, Angel was willing to follow him. But then they'd learned what was going on in Enerwin. It wasn't what any of them had come to do, but someone had to do something, and after learning what they were all capable of, the five of them were just confident enough to try. But now that confidence was faltering. Sending the others to deal with the rest of the cult while he handled the leader, it seemed like a much better plan before Phoenix actually saw the inside of the church the leader was holed up in. The nave's wooden pews were full of dozens of people, all sitting motionless in their seats, eyes blank as they craned their necks to look up at the ceiling. All Phoenix saw when he looked up was more smoke, blanketing the ceiling and flashing like storm clouds. The cult's leaders stood at the front of the room, positioned behind the priest's podium, waiting. Tall, impossibly thin, with stark white hair and a deeply receded widow's peak, black linen robes hung from his frame and swallowed his legs. A narrow twelve-pointed star was crudely carved into his forehead. All members of the Cult of Stars marked themselves this way, believing it granted them insight and power. Considering what he was seeing, Phoenix was starting to think they were right about that. Hello, child. The man greeted him. His voice was unsettlingly calm, and his silver eyes bored into Phoenix. I see you and your companions turned down your opportunity to run. 
Have you come to bear witness, then? Phoenix looked around again, at the entire town's population sitting in a trance, and at the smoke that enveloped everything else in the church. His finger drifted to his crossbow's trigger. To what? To the return of this world to its rightful owners, the cultist said. The elves are dead, Phoenix stated. The man let out a low growl and the pins and needles Phoenix felt in his boots intensified. In his mind, a theory formed on the source of the smoke. Phoenix swore he saw the carving on the cultist's head grow larger. The elves are nothing. Pretenders to the throne of creation, whose hubris inflicted the world with the infestation of humanity, the cultist spat. No. I speak of the true lords of creation, those born among the stars whose very being governs existence. Phoenix had read a lot of books in his seventeen short years, but he knew very little about the starborn, beings said to be older than the gods. But even what little he did know told him they weren't something he wanted coming back to the world. The younger glint chaser took aim at the cultist and loosed the crossbow bolt at his chest. Just before it struck, a cloud of smoke burst out from the man's torso, and the bolt vanished into it. When the smoke dissipated, the man stood unharmed. Phoenix swallowed. With a casual expression and complete lack of urgency, the man drifted out from behind the podium and slowly stalked Phoenix drawing an undulating dagger. The doors of the church slammed shut of their own accord. Very well. Join this place as a sacrifice to the stars. Phoenix frantically looked around the room, his heart pounding. He loaded and fired a second bolt, only to meet similar results. His mind raced, taking in everything around him and looking for the best way out of the situation his bravado had gotten himself into. What did you think you would accomplish by coming here, Glint Chaser? The man said mockingly. Did you think you were a match for me? Or your companions a match for my own? He prayed to Avelina, Eleanor, and every other saint he'd ever heard the name of that he hadn't made a colossal mistake in coming here relying on a group of strangers to have his back. He backed away from the cultist and threw a hunk of recovered lightstone from his pocket as hard as he could. It shattered at the cultist's feet, producing a dazzling flash that Phoenix used as cover to make a break for the doors. They didn't budge. An unsettlingly cold hand gripped him by the shoulder, and the cult leader loomed over him. Any last words? Phoenix dug another crossbow bolt from his bag. He didn't think he could load it in time, and by now he wasn't sure shooting the man would work, but at the very least, he could try stabbing with it. But just as he was bracing to fight for his life, he caught movement in the shadows of the nave behind the cult leader. Immediate relief surged through him, and his shaky legs steadied. One of his companions must have gotten inside. Yeah, Phoenix said. You really should have found better help. The cultist paused, raising an eyebrow before letting out a gurgling, choking sound as a dagger drove through the back of his neck. A moment later, another was slipped between his ribs. He dropped to the ground, his body scattering the smoke as he fell. As he lay twitching, the smoke rapidly thinned out until the last wisps of it curled away in time with the cultist breathing his last. It was over. Cutting it kind of close there, don't you think? Phoenix asked. The thief girl from the motley company he'd assembled brushed her dark hair out of her amber eyes. Her normally white face was flushed pink from exertion. I worked as fast as I could, all right? You try getting the drop on these guys. It's like they have eyes in the back of their heads, Snow said, yanking her blades free and wiping them on her pant leg. 
You're welcome, by the way. Her voice was as cool and collected as ever, but her eyes were wide with adrenaline. Maybe it was just the fact that she'd saved his life, but Phoenix thought they were the most beautiful eyes he'd ever seen. Where's everyone else? Hopefully outside, Snow called out. Yep, good news, Brass's voice answered from outside the church. Angel killed all the bad people. Bad news? Our cleric has a weak stomach. Snow glanced around the church full of bewildered people, some of whom had noticed the teenagers standing over the freshly killed body and looked concerned. Suddenly self-conscious about the blood on her pants, she took a step toward Phoenix, subtly positioning him between herself and the townspeople. Any ideas on what we're supposed to do now? she asked. Phoenix tried and failed to gauge the looks on the gathered faces. He'd researched every scrap of information he could find on the old world's history and possible locations of its greatest treasures. He had read zero books on consoling the recently mind-controlled. And yet, he felt exhilarated. It was more than just an adrenaline high from looking death in the face. His thoughts were racing, trying to process everything he'd seen the cultists do. There was so much to unpack, so much he discovered, and so many more new, unanswered questions. If this was how being a freelancer always felt, he was beginning to think he could get used to it. Well, he said, turning his attention to the townspeople, how about we start by explaining what just happened to them, and work it out from there? And here I was, thinking the hard part of the day was over, she retorted. You know, if you and Brass want to run, now's really the time, he offered. She looked him up and down and smirked. Nah, she said. I think we'll stick around a while. 18. Snow We need to talk, Snow said. She slipped off the roof of the inn, landing silently. She looked like she was waiting for him to say something. And after a moment, Armin realized it was because his mouth was hanging open. When he'd tracked down Brass at the lilac, he'd prepared to run into her. Initiated it, even. This was different. This paralyzed him. Say something, damn it. Hey. Snow sighed and hooked her thumbs into her belt. She'd been hoping she could avoid this part. Hey. She looked him over. His face had a light dusting of soot, save where his goggles would have been. There were holes in his coat and armor. Those had to be fresh, because he always repaired those whenever he got the chance. That, or he'd just gotten sloppy. He did look a little softer than she remembered. Maybe put on a little weight. The beard was definitely more of a mess than it had ever been before. So, you're in town, Armin said. Yep. They stood an arm's length apart. Armin could clearly see his breath now, but his armor kept him from feeling the cold. Snow tapped her foot. He wanted to say something. She knew he did. He always wanted to say something. Okay, we need to skip this part, Snow said as her patience ran out. What part? She skipped the explanation and jumped ahead, hoping to shock him into business. There's a contract out on your head. Yeah, I noticed, Armin said. A little late with the warning there. He missed the point, so she tried again. More explicit this time. There's a contract out on your head that I heard about. The way Snow stressed it finally got through to Armin, and he felt stupid for not putting it together the first time she said it. People only told Snow about the biggest, highest-paying jobs. Nothing else was worth her time. If she'd heard of the price on his head, he was in deep, deep shit. His thoughts started racing, and with it came the pacing. Why is this happening? Why now? I don't know. How much do you know? It's a hit list, Snow said. Decently long one. A lot of the names on it aren't worth much. 
but the ones at the top are a small fortune. A bunch of freelancers, mostly. And right now, you're in the top bracket. I'm flattered, he said, masking his panic. Who put it out? I don't know that either, Snow said. It's all brokers and go-betweens. All I know is whoever they are, they want you alive. Snow didn't say that like it was good news, and Armin knew it wasn't. Death was quick, and there were countless reasons to want someone dead, especially someone with a career history like his. But alive meant they wanted something from him, and would do whatever it took to get it. There are a lot of zeros attached to you right now, Snow said. Every Dirk and Corsar has their eyes on it. Some of the best of the best. And it's specifically said alive. Actually, no, Snow said. Alive or intact body. But there's a pay cut for bringing in a corpse. And it's big enough to cover a resurrection. Armin gripped his wand to feel it there and have a reminder that he wasn't helpless. That he'd dealt with things like this before, and he could do so again. There was also the fact that Snow was, at the end of the day, an assassin. And there was a price on his head. Are you? No, I'm not after it. She'd been waiting for that one. It's a big number, but it'd have to be a bit bigger before I went after you. Oh? I know how dangerous you can be when you're backed into a corner, Snow said. Hazard pay? So much for old time's sake. Thanks. Armin scratched his chin. What about Brass? He's on it, too, same bracket as you, Snow nodded. So is Church. And Angel, which is frankly underselling her. What about you? People know better than to come after me, Snow said quickly. It made sense to Armin. Freelancers like Phoenix, like Brass, were useful, dependable, or troublesome, depending on who you asked. But Snow had a different sort of reputation, the kind that made people check over their shoulders before invoking her name. But that got him thinking about the assassins who'd attacked him and Brass already, bounty hunters and freelancers they'd never heard of. They were no slouches, but they didn't hold a candle to Snow. If there's such a big reward on the table, why haven't I run into any of them yet? Armin asked. They're biding their time, Snow said, letting the small fish go first to see what they're dealing with. It's what I'd do in a mess like this. Have you told the others? Armin asked. A thin layer of frost started to creep across Snow's cheeks. Church wouldn't listen to me even if I tried. Angel definitely wouldn't. And Brass? For a moment, even Armin could see there was something she was holding back. But she buried it, and it was gone. I'd rather not deal with Brass right now. What about the Golden Shield? They were on the list. Somebody fucked that one up. Any idea who? Armin asked. Information about the attack on the shield might help get ink off his back. Snow hesitated, and Armin realized she knew. She was just debating whether or not to tell him. It was pitch. Armin's eyes went wide. Years ago, pitch had been a member of the court of Enwin, one of the only companies to ever match the Starbreakers. That is, until Ink got him kicked out for being too difficult to work with. If he was after the contract, things were even worse than he thought. Oh, yeah, Snow said. So he's out there, and probably after you or one of the others. Armin's pacing ground to a halt as the pile of information finally became too much. He leaned against the chiller and slowly slid down the side of it until he was sitting in the frozen dirt. His head spun. This was at least part of what he'd wanted out of Clock Tower. But it was more or less the worst-case scenario. Whoever was after him was paying top dollar. That was going to attract very dangerous people. 
and he wasn't the only target. How many were there? Too many for Harbin. Snow stayed standing. On some level, it felt wrong, dumping all of this on him. But he had to know. The better he found out now, before it was too late. He'd figure out how to deal with it. If he didn't, he'd be dead in a few weeks. Sorry. She turned to leave. Where are you going? She looked up at the sky, trying to avoid looking at him. I came to warn you. Warning delivered. I've got other things to handle. Wait. She turned around. Her eyes had turned a pale white. Frost was clinging to her hands in armor now. She'd gone cold on him. I'm not staying. Armin felt a hundred sentences get stuck in his throat at once. A snow vanished from sight and reappeared on the roof of the inn. No hand gesture, no arcane glyphs or distortion of the air. Just there one moment, gone in the next. A thief's shadow blink. She moved silently across the rooftop, poised to disappear over the other side. Armin watched her, thinking about how long it had been since he'd seen her, wondering if he'd ever see her again. Everything he wanted to say fought to be heard, until in the end, nothing came out. Just before she went over the other side, Snow looked back at him, a hint of blue having crept back into her eyes. Good luck. And without another word, she was gone. Well, it's no surprise Phoenix and Brass were unsuccessful both in the underworld and with the Academy. But with a price on their heads, what will they do when the real hunters come out of the shadows? Stay tuned to find out. So, don't forget to subscribe to CamCat Unwrapped. Tune in to hear all our audiobooks as we release them right here on CamCat Unwrapped as serialized podcasts. The first two episodes of every book can always be found here but subsequent episodes will be available for free listening only for a short time after their release. After that, they'll be gone. But don't worry, the audiobooks are available for purchase on Audible and other major audio retailers. If you don't want to miss a beat, listen now on the audiobook platform of your choice. All our books are also available in print and ebook formats on camcatbooks.com or wherever books are sold. Before you go, please take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Thank you. ChemCat Unwrapped also offers other ChemCat books as podcasts. Also, you can check out our interviews with authors, editors, and other bookworms, and our background episodes, where we unwrap exclusive content relating to our books. Tune in again to ChemCat Unwrapped, because ChemCat Unwrapped is where book lovers meet.